Tom Wolf, I'm a member of the HASP Science, uh, Medicine and Technology Committee, and I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Natalie Beacons. Ms. Beacons is the Invasive Species Coordinator for the West Michigan Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas. Ms. Beacon earned a BA in Wildlife Biology from Grand Valley State and an MS in Biology from Eastern K Kentucky University. Her graduate research focused on the impacts that hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, adelgid has had on overall hemlock health in the composition of avian communities in Kentucky. This research led her to pursue a position on the front lines of invasive species management back here in her home state of Michigan. Ms. Beacons will uh, discuss invasive plants that are used in landscaping and garden settings. Uh, she, she'll also identify some of the most aggressive invasive plants and what the downsides are to introducing them to your property. And finally, she will also discuss what native plants you can cultivate instead and the benefits they can bring to your local ecosystem. Natalie, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. You can see my presentation, correct? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so like you said, my name is Natalie Beacons, and I am the Invasive Species Project Coordinator for the West Michigan SISMA. And today we are going to talk about the do's and don'ts of native landscaping. First, though, I would just like to go over what a SISMA is. A lot of times when I introduce that, people look at me like I I'm just throwing out letters. Um, so ASISMA is a cooperative invasive species management area. Um, and it's basically just a group of government and nonprofit organizations um, that come together to survey and treat invasive species in our service area. Um, our main goal as the SISMA is to be the one that facilitates that cooperation between all of those groups and across all of those jurisdictional boundaries. Um, in Michigan, there are 22 SISMAs, um, but my SISMA that myself and my co-coordinator run um, consists of seven counties. So it's Oceana, Nuego, Muskegon, Ottawa, Kent, Montcalm, and Allegan. And my CISMA runs two main programs that we have grant funding for. So we have an invasive species um, plant strike team um, that is hired every summer. And they go throughout our seven counties and they treat various invasive species, aquatic and terrestrial. Um, we're funded through the Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program, which is a state funding source, and then we're also uh, funded through the United States Forest Service. Our other main program um, is the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid program. So we have a crew of five individuals that are on year round, and they're funded through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and another um, Michigan Invasive Species Program grant. And they are basically employed through the state to treat hemlock trees that are being infested and killed um, by this little bug called hemlock woolly adelgid. So that's just a little bit about what we do and who I am and where I come from. Um, but today we're gonna talk about um, native and invasive plants. Um, but I just wanna give you a little outline of my PowerPoint. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about garden planning um, to begin with, and then how the state classifies different species of plant, um, why it's important to plant native species over non-native or invasive, the do's and don'ts, so native and non-native species that you should and should not plant. We're going to start with the don'ts though, and then some honorable mentions that uh, myself and some of my coworkers felt are favorites or important to mention and then general resources that you can use in your planning for your native garden. All right, so we're gonna start off 
um, by talking about how we should go about garden planning. So there's really two phases of pre-design and design. Um, when you are considering your pre-design plan, there are some things you should think about. Um, first of all, you should measure your space um, and map it out on a piece of paper if you can. This will help you understand um, how much space you have for how many plugs you should buy of plants, um, as well as the different heights that you might want to consider. Another good thing to do is test your soil. Um, you can do this at Home Depot or you can send in samples to the state. Um, and this is a really good way to understand the composition of your soil and what types of plants will and will not thrive there. Um, then you want to determine your different light levels. So I'm sure as most of you know, um, when you buy a plant native or non-native, it usually comes with a tag that tells you um, what it favors um, as far as light goes. Um, but what I did not know until I got into this field is that those actually have like quantitative measurements. So full sun usually means that it has, um, it gets greater than six hours of direct sunlight. Part sun uh, encompasses a space that gets four to six hours of direct light, mostly in the afternoon. Um, part shade is also four to six hours of direct sunlight, but mostly in the morning. And then shade would be anything that gets less than four hours of direct light throughout the day. I also recommend that you go through a native uh, plant catalog, um, which I'll give you some resources where you can get some of those at the end. Um, and really just look at what you like, what you're attracted to and make a plant wish list of things that maybe you haven't really thought through what you can have, but would like to have. Um, and then lastly, and probably most important, really think about what your goal is for your space. So are you interested in using it to entertain um, your family and friends? Is it something that you would rather um, build up a lot of shrubs and trees for privacy? Or do you have a really large space where you have options um, to really consider conservation and maybe create some type of pollinator garden. <clears throat> when you're designing, um, there's some general and specific elements to consider. Um, first and foremost, you need to consider um, the, some of these things when you think about your layout. So when you're thinking about your bed creation, um, there are beds that you can do that are internal in the ground and above the ground but really um, the kind of space you have will dictate that. Um, you also need to consider if you have hardscapes on your property already, such as paths, patios, or decks, or if you're interested in implementing a hardscape like a rain barrel. Um, and speaking of rain barrels, you need to consider uh, the distance to your water source, um, especially when considering what plants you want to plant. Environmental impacts is one that I think that we forget about most often. And this is something that um, for me, I, the example that comes to mind is our hemlock trees. So a lot of times when we go to sites to treat these hemlock trees for this little bug, um, we'll see trees along roadsides or driveways that have really yellowed a lot. And that is from the plowing in the winter and the salt from the trucks getting sprayed up. So when you are planning your garden and your landscape, you want to consider other um, impacts of machinery or, you know, lawnmowers or trucks that might be coming through and the impacts that those might have on different species. Some specific elements to consider um, when you start to narrow down your wish list of plants is variation. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this at the end, um, but variation is key to an excellent pollinator garden um, and really just any natural garden. You want to have a large variation in color and height and texture of plants, as well as bloom time specifically if you're considering pollinators. Um, but you don't just need that variation between your plants. You also need it in the placement of your plants. So if you are placing your plants against an edge, you want to make sure that you're putting all your tall plants in the back so that everything is getting, um, getting displayed. 
Um, if you have more of an island shaped uh, area, then you're going to want to put your tall plants in the middle. And lastly, just a tip. Um, if you are interested in a more natural look versus a very ornamental um, structured look, you're going to want to place your plants in odd numbered masses, um, kind of like this, uh, these dots on the bottom on the left, and not in rows. But if you are looking for more of that structure, clean finish, um, which you can absolutely do with native plants, then you're going to want to use, um, use a more structured look like that. So now let's talk about some terms and definitions um, that the state uses to define and classify different species. These uh, would fall under native species, non-native species, invasive species, and then how we categorize our different invasive species. So native species are plants that um, have, they occur naturally in a region in which they evolve. So they're the ecological basis upon which life depends, including insects, birds, and even people. Uh, many specialist species or wildlife can't really um, complete their life cycles without their specific native vegetation counterpart. And that, spe that specifically relates to insects. They require that native fauna to carry out their life cycle. A non-native species is a species that has been introduced by humans or um, other outside of its natural past or present distribution. Um, many non-native species in Michigan include fruits, vegetables, field crops, livestock, and domestic animals. And these things are all very important to our economy and lifestyle, um, but they rarely uh, provide any ecological value to wildlife or ourselves. And then lastly, we have uh, invasive species. So the state defines invasive species as a species that is not native and whose introduction causes harm or is likely to cause harm to Michigan's economy, environment, or human health. So this can come in the form of habitat degradation um, due to loss of biodiversity. Or, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at this middle photo here, um, it can even include uh, structural damage. So this is a picture of Japanese knotweed that is growing through a foundation. Um, and that is one of our biggest ones in Michigan right now that we're struggling with. So invasive species kind of get broken down into categories as well, even further. So invasive species on the watch list, which you can look up um, on michigan.gov, have been identified as being immediate and significant threats to Michigan's natural resources. These species either have never been confirmed in the wild in Michigan or have a limited known distribution. So they're not quite here yet. There's something to watch for. Some species um, are legally designated by the state of Michigan as either prohibited or restricted. If a species is prohibited or restricted, it is unlawful to possess them, introduce them, import them, sell them, or offer them in a live manner in any way, um, except for educational purposes. And in that case, you need a permit. Um, the term prohibited species is usually used for a species that is not widely distributed through the state yet. Um, but often there are, there are not control methods available yet for that species. Um, the term restricted is applied to species that are established in the state already. And there are management and control practices available um, to take care of those species. So why do we want to plant native plants? Um, there's a lot of different schools of thought in this, but three of the big ones are that they're hardier and less maintenance. Um, they reduce flooding events and they attract native wildlife. So plants native to Michigan have already um, adapted to their harsh winters and warm summers, and they are ready to handle anything Michigan's crazy weather can throw at them. 
Um, when they are planted correctly and established, native plants often do not require irrigation, fertilization, or uh, winter protection. So in the long run, they're actually economically more feasible because they require less maintenance than babysitting. They also are um, prone to reducing flood events. So native plants have deeper root systems by nature and it allows heavy water flow to be pulled into the soil rather than just rushing over top of it, um, causing a flooding event. They also have the ability to prevent erosion with these deeper roots. They can hold the soil in place. So if you look at this graphic on the left, um, you can see our classic native plants have significantly um, deeper roots than our non-natives. Our non-natives tend to have roots that spread out along the surface, which makes them much more prone to erosion, especially on critical dune areas. Um, as well as not being able to hold as much water as our natives. Lastly, um, we prefer native plants because they attract native wildlife. So these plants have adapted alongside the native wildlife and have established long lasting relationships. While snow, showy non-native flowers attract some pollinators, um, they're not their host plants where they can lay eggs. So a lot of times you will find that a non-native species can't support an entire life cycle where a native species can. Um, and by being a larval host for a lot of these native wildlife butterflies, for instance, you also are supporting bird populations that like to feed on those insect larvae um, that live on those native plants. The native berries also tend to be more nutritious and healthy for wildlife, which I will say over and over again when I'm talking about the downfalls of some of these non-native species. Um, they just don't hold the same nutritional value um, as the species that did evolve in this range. Uh, native gardens, therefore, are known to create kind of a mini wildlife haven because they do um, have so many positive effects for the ecosystems around them. So let's talk a little bit about the don'ts first. Um, we're going to talk about some species. These are for sale um, in your uh, nurseries, your local um, greenhouses. Uh, but they are ones that are known to jump out of cultivation and become invasive um, and have become problem plants in Michigan specifically. So um, we're going to talk about, and this is not an encompassing list by any means, just some that I would like to highlight. Um, we're going to talk about Japanese barberry, burning bush, Bradford pear, invasive bittersweet, and common periwinkle. So to start out, let's discuss Japanese barberry. So it is a spiny deciduous shrub that's usually one to two feet tall. Um, but when it jumps out of cultivation, it can grow up to six feet in height. Uh, as you can see in that right picture there, it does have a red fruiting body um, that the birds or wildlife will eat um, and disperse the plant that way. It does have thorns um, that are very sharp, and this reduces the amount of browse that we'll see wildlife um, have on them. So this gives them kind of another leg up on native fauna when they do escape that um, garden setting. So as you can see in this very bottom picture, um, this is one of the impacts when Japanese barberry gets out into our wild areas. Uh, they create these dense stands that really just crowd out absolutely everything else and decrease the biodiversity of the overall ecosystem. They have the ability to raise the pH levels in their soil, making it a more suitable habitat for themselves and a less suitable habitat for anything else that was there before. And probably one of the biggest deters for us in Michigan is that they make a little microhabitat for ticks. So 
Um, they're favorable because they provide this buffered climate within them um, and it limits the amount of moisture that the ticks will lose. So they just thrive in these bushes, unfortunately. Um, another species to think about uh, is the winged burning bush. So it looks a lot like the Japanese barberry, but it's a little bit bigger and it does not have those same um, thorns. It's a deciduous shrub that can grow up to 15 to 20 feet tall. Its seeds are also um, dispersed by birds and wildlife, but again, they do not have the same amount of nutritional value that some of our native species would have. And this is another species that the deer tend to avoid, which gives them, again, a leg up on native fauna that does get munched on a little bit. Um, these actually create a very similar issue to um, the barberry, where once they get out of that garden setting, they really take off and um, take over that understory of our forest, decreasing general biodiversity. So the next one I want to talk about is Bradford pear, and this is a species that you will often see used in a city planning setting. Um, and once it gets out of that kind of arena, that's when you really have problems with it. So it's a deciduous tree that can grow up to 30, 30 to 50 feet in height. It does have those little white uh, delicate flowers that flower in the early spring. And again, these seeds are dispersed by wildlife, typically. Um, they really become an issue if they reach um, any type of disturbed or open field. Um, they have the ability to take over in a number of years. And because their fruit does not have as much nutritional value, they'll basically crop out any of the other critical food resources that wildlife might use. Um, and then wildlife is forced to use these and it is not as beneficial to them and it can create some issues for wildlife and pollinators. This species, invasive bittersweet, is one that we um, in our seven counties of service area really are trying to focus on currently this year. Um, so <clears throat> it's a woody perennial vine that can climb up to 60 feet in height. It has these green fruiting bodies, um, but more often you'll see them as red in the winter when they change. It's a really good way to help you identify them. They disperse through their roots um, and these little red berry seeds, which again, wildlife will transport. So I'm sure if you've been through the Lower Grand area, you have seen these dense mats of bittersweet um, along our woody vegetation. Um, they will take over in a matter of years and completely shade out the shrubs or bushes beneath, uh, and it will lead to eventual mortality. It also has the ability to just wrap around the tree very tightly and eventually girdle the trunk or the branches. So this species in particular is one that um, can go from a small problem to a very large problem very, very quickly. Common periwinkle is more of a um, ground cover type of plant. It's a perennial evergreen vine and it typically has a purple to blue flower. Um, it seeds, that's the most common way that it reproduces. Uh, and a lot of times people will plant it for general cover, um, but as the years continue, you'll see that it will get out of control and end up covering your whole hillside as it did at my parents' house, for instance. Um, and this really just, it will choke out your native grasses or sedges that might be there and create a dense mat, again, decreasing general biodiversity. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the species that we can plant instead that are native to Michigan um, that are comparable to our don'ts. So we're gonna discuss nine bark, um, red osier dogwood, flowering dogwood, climbing rose, and wild ginger. 
So instead of Japanese barberry, right, that thorny red bush, um, we could instead plant nine bark, which still gives you that bright red color um, that you might be looking for um, to have something stand out in your garden. So it's a deciduous shrub that can grow five to nine feet tall. It has white or sometimes pink bell-shaped flowers. Um, and they typically flower in the late spring to summer. So it's a little bit of a later flowering than your early spring. Um, this plant is particularly great if you have a wide range of um, soil types or, um, or just habitat in your backyard because it is able to flourish in all kinds of conditions. Um, it can thrive in, from sun to shade um, and it's a really generalist species um, that's good for that. So its flowers provide nectar for pollinators and birds also consume these seeds, but because it is native, it has a little bit better nutritional value than some of those other species that we talked about before. It also provides excellent cover for small mammals um, via its bushiness and lack of thorns like our barberry had. So instead of winged burning bush, that big bright red bush um, that we talked about, we could plant red osier dogwood. Now in the summertime, it does have green leaves unlike our burning bush, but in the winter, as you can see in that top photo, you do get a little bit of that red color that you might be looking for in your landscape. So this is another deciduous shrub that can be three to nine feet tall. Um, it has flat umbrella-like uh, white flowers that uh, flower in the late spring to summer. It prefers a more moist area. So if you have any type of like creek bed running through your landscape or anything like that, this is a really good um, native plant to put there. You will naturally find them in that type of setting. And they can thrive in anything from shade to sun. So a pretty variable species in regards to growing conditions. Again, these flowers provide nectar for pollinators and um, the birds and mammals will consume their seeds. And they actually found a little bit of a symbiotic relationship between the dogwood and um, general wildlife. They found that the seeds will germinate better after they have gone through um, an animal's digestive tract. So, um, you can see that relationship already starting to bud. Next, instead of the Bradford pear, I would recommend um, planting a flowering dogwood. So you get that same strikingly white, beautiful color. Um, it's a deciduous tree that can grow 20 to 40 feet tall. It is um, a white to pink flower, and it's the, usually the tree that you see blooming first thing in the spring. It's one of the first things to pop. Um, it can grow in dry to moist conditions um, and it prefers part shade to shade areas. This is a really good example of a tree that does not need protection. Um, as a younger tree, it is very cold tolerant having evolved in our Michigan area. Um, this is another example of a species that has, is excellent for pollinators and birds and mammals with its fruit. Um, but going one step further, it is an actual larval host for the spring azure. So larval host plants are um, really one of the things you want to consider when you are creating any type of butterfly garden. They're a plant that is required by the caterpillar for growth and development. And by planting these host plants in your garden, you offer the promise of food to the next generation of caterpillar or butterfly. So instead of invasive bittersweet, I chose a species that is still a climbing species, um, but is native. So the climbing rose is a perennial shrub uh, and it produces long canes annually and can grow to be 12 feet tall with help. So if you have that space that you really do want something climbing, um, this would be a good example. If you give it, if you give it the structure, it will climb it 
for you. Um, it has those simple pale pink uh, roses and it will be blooming in the spring. It does not prefer a super wet or super dry condition um, and it likes full to partial sun. It does occur naturally in open woods um, in thickets, which is one of the reasons it's beneficial. So because it provides that dense um, cover, it's really great for small mammal cover, but also in the spring and summer, you will find small birds growing up in it as well. Um, so it's a really good little cover habitat for them. Uh, instead of periwinkle, which was that ground cover plant, um, if you still want that purple color, um, I would recommend prairie violet. So this is a, um, it's a low growing uh, perennial and it displays in blue to violet um, with a white throated flower. It will bloom in the spring to early summer. Um, and if you're lucky, it will also uh, bloom in the fall as well. It prefers a well-drained soil. Um, it will do well in full sun or partial sun lighting. And this species is actually threatened in Michigan, um, but you can purchase it at native nurseries if you look around. Um, they do have it, so I really recommend if you have the area that is suited for it, um, planting it to try to get it to get a, a little better of a population here. These small flowers, this is a, a, something I'll talk about when I talk about um, pollinator gardens, but these small flowers are a really good example of diversifying your different shapes and sizes. So these are smaller, so it's more um, likely to attract a small bee or a small beetle or even a small fly for pollination. Um, so it really gives that niche species, other niche species, a chance at those resources. This is another uh, example of a larval host for fertility butterflies specifically. Um, this one doesn't have, uh, so like our per the periwinkle we talked about really gives you that ground cover. I don't feel that prairie violet gives you that as much. So I just wanna include one more for um, a substitute for periwinkle. I find this plant fascinating, um, wild ginger. It's a low growing herb um, and it has a very unique flower that occurs at the base of the stem. If you look in those first two pictures, you can see, um, which is very unusual. It typically uh, will bloom in the spring and it prefers a moist soil um, and shade. So you'll find this naturally in any, really an open forest. That's maybe in a lowland. Um, so, the flower on these, that little bell-shaped bell thing, um, it attracts small pollinating flies that emerge from the ground early in the spring looking for thawing ca carcasses of animals that didn't survive the winter. Um, by laying next to the ground, the flower has made itself readily available, available for those little emerging flies. Um, and because the color of the flower is so similar to that decomposing flesh, uh, those flies are attracted to it. There is some dispute about whether or not those flies pollinate the flower, um, but nevertheless, they do enter the flower to escape those early cold spring temperatures, um, providing a service to those flies um, and that little niche animal that maybe didn't have that before. They also work in tangent with ants. Um, so their seeds have this oily um, little food structure on it. And so the, the ants will come and they will take the fruit back to their nest underground where they will um, eat the fruit and then leave the seed where the seed will then germinate underground and grow. So it's another example of um, a symbiotic relationship, which is pretty cool. And this is, again, a good one for if you, if you want that ground cover. So 
Next, I would just want to talk about some honorable mentions. Um, we're going to look at swamp rose mallow, prairie drop seed, and then I just want to talk a little bit about pollinator gardens. Maybe I'm going to give some examples of, of what you can use and why, and just things to look for. So swamp rose mallow is a perennial hibiscus that is native to Michigan. Um, this one is my favorite. I, it has these big, beautiful, showy flowers, and it is a late bloomer, so it will bloom in midsummer to fall. So um, that timing, if you're looking for something that will come out a little bit later, this is a really good example. It's also a good one to use if you have an area that is um, retains a lot of water or heavily moist. Um, these can handle swampy environments. So um, any damp area in your landscape that you need to seed, this is a really good uh, option. It does like full sun and these flowers, like I said, will provide that late um, nectar for those butterflies and bees. Um, and then again, once it goes to seed in the winter fall time when it's getting a little bit colder, it gives um, a little bit of a later food source for birds as well. Uh, prairie drop seed is a really great native grass that you can use if you do want to cultivate that more um, professional garden look, right? That's very clean and cut. It's very soft looking. It's very contained. Um, it's a really good grass to use for prairie gardens, um, and it will flower in the late summer, though it is a grass, so it's not like your typical flower that people think of. These do really well in damp areas with full sun. Um, and I think these are really excellent um, options when it comes to something on a hill. Um, it's, they're really great for erosion control. Um, and they are browse resistant, so you don't need to worry so much about those uh, little critters um, chewing on them at the beginning of the season. Okay, now I just want to give some tips and things to think about if you are interested in planting a pollinator garden specifically. So early blooming plants or very late bloomers are often the most needed food source for pollinators um, since there are fewer flowers and resources available during those times. So the very beginning and the very end of the season are, are ones that are most important in a pollinator garden. Um, by providing a wide range of bloom sizes and shapes, you're encouraging insects of all sizes um, and, and um, natural histories to be able to utilize your pollinator garden. So that's something to really think about. Make sure you have a lot of variety. Again, my last point, more variety, the better. Um, and then at the bottom here, I just have some examples and I just wanna talk about why these might be um, good examples to include or think about when you are creating your garden for your pollinators. So Trillium actually does not have any nectar and it is pollinated strictly by flies and beetles. So if you're looking for a species that um, will incorporate the pollinators that maybe get forgotten, you know, they're not our bumblebees and butterflies, this is a really good example. Um, they, for the insects, not for us, they exude um, an odor that attracts carrion flies and beetles specifically to pollinate their flowers. The next one is columbine. Um, so these have those elongated spurs and tubular nectacles, ne nectaries, I'm sorry, filled with sweet nectar. Um, and these have evolved alongside a variety of pollinators that are um, physically special to fit their tongues or feeding mouth parts into these specifically. So um, whether it uh, hummingbirds or long tongue bees or hawk moths, um, many different types of columbines have adapted to different pollinator groups. So if you're looking for species that you want to incorporate that 
will um, cater to specialists, Columbine is a really good uh, choice for that. Next, we have sneezeweed, uh, which sounds like an allergy attack, but I promise it is not. Um, sneezeweed blooms for many weeks. Um, it starts in the late summer and it will continue to the mid fall. So if you're looking for that long lasting bloom to support your pollinators at the end of the season, this is an excellent example. Um, and then lastly, we have pink turtle head. So when I was talking a little bit earlier about the different shapes and sizes of flower that you can incorporate, this is a really good example of, um, of what I mean by that. So you can see uh, it looks like a little turtle head and it has that hole in the center. And these really <laughs> cater to bumblebees quite often um, because the bumblebee will squeeze itself into the flower um, and get that nectar treat at the bottom, but also um, because it has to squeeze into the flower, the pollen will cover it. So you will have flowers of different sizes that cater to different bee sizes um, or flies that, that will be pollinating these plants. Um, these also just in general have a pretty long bloom time. Um, so that is also something to consider. Okay, lastly, I just want to go over some different resources that are out there for you as you plan your native garden, because like I said, the stuff that I covered does not even scratch the surface of what is possible, which is one of the best parts about native plants, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about um, conservation districts, Audubon, the U.S. Forest Service, and then lastly, NIST. So I know I was informed you guys are actually, there's a lot of you and you're from all over, I'm sure. Um, so what I would recommend is first checking out your local conservation district website. Um, I know that HOPE is located in Holland, so I chose the two closest to that, but that does not mean that that is where you need to go. Um, I, our Ottawa conservation district currently is having a native plant sale that ends May 21st. Um, and they hold it every spring and every fall. They have a tree sale. The same with Allegan Conservation Districts. Their spring tree sale um, is on April 22nd. And I did a little bit of research um, into them and it looks like they're actually holding an event where you can go speak to foresters um, and different experts and talk to them about your space and what you would like to plant. And that just feels like a really excellent resource. Um, so. Even if you're not near either of these, I highly recommend um, just Googling your conservation district that's close to you. Most of them have spring um, native tree and plant sales. The next option um, that I would highly recommend is going and looking at Audubon. So I, <laughs> I studied birds for a lot of my career. So I am partial to <laughs> Um, avian species being in my yard. Um, so this Audubon has this really cool tool where you can go and you can enter in your email address and your zip code and it will basically give you a list of plants that are native to your region and it will tell you um, what they will grow up to look like, what the adults will look like, what they um, prefer, kind of like the points that I gave in my talk, um, but then it will also tell you what avian species it will attract. And I thought that was really cool. And then you can, um, if you click by now, it will take you to a, um, to your most local Audubon um, source. So they do, do plant sales as well, um, or it will direct you to native nurseries, local native nurseries in your area. So I thought that was a really cool resource. If you're interested in increasing your avian populations um, around your home. Next, um, I just always love to bring up um, the United States Forest Service has a plethora of resources on landscaping or um, curtailing your yard to whatever you want, really. This is an example, um, just basic instructions for native plant landscaping that they have on their website. 
Um, but if you scroll down, they have just so many links um, with how to's and like if you want more small mammals, this is these are some things that you can plant. If you would like, um, you know, more deer in your yard, these are some things that you can do. So um, I highly recommend um, just going on their website and, and clicking around in their um, wildflower area on their page. It's very, very informative. And also, you know that um, they have they have done studies to back this stuff up. So you know it is a reliable source where you're getting um, you're getting good information. Okay, so lastly, I just want to talk about very quickly um, MISIN. So this is the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network. And this is basically a website where all government, well, not all, but state and, and local agencies take all of their invasive species data and upload it here. Um, and it even goes a step further and it has a smartphone app that provides um, this mobile solution to capture uh, invasive species field observations um, right where you are outside. So um, even you can play an important role in early detection and rapid response for these invasive species threats in our communities. Um, so if you download the app, it has all kinds of resources where you can browse different um, species that you might be looking at in real time it will give you image composites so that you can look over um, what a plant might look like and different identifying characteristics. And it will show you in real time um, where these species have been observed or reported previously by other agencies or citizen scientists. And speaking of citizen scientists, um, you can do this yourself. So if you're out and about and you see invasive bittersweet, for instance, you can go into the app and report it live right there. Um, and if you're not sure about your ID skills, you can take a photograph and post it and add the observation to the data so that um, SISMAs and, and government agencies can be sure to address um, you know, these in, invasive species on public and private lands, which often get overlooked. So like I said, this is just barely scratching the surface of possibilities for your native species landscape that you can create. Um, that's one of the great things about invasive species or native species, I'm so sorry, um, is that there's really a shape and size for everyone um, and everyone's taste. Um, and this presentation was just an effort to, um, to showcase those relationships that our native vegetation has with the natural world around us. And if you guys have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Nellie, uh, this is Ralph. And uh, when you were talking about the swamp rose mallow, mm -hmm. uh, we had a couple of those uh, here on the shore of Pigeon River. And when the lake rose, of course, they were all drowned. When, as the lake goes back down again, will those come back from, uh, you know, seeds that may have been dropped or, or whatever? It is possible. I can't say for certain, but it's definitely possible if you had a seed uh, wash up on a bank and, and not, you know, get completely drowned out. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how long their seed bank is viable for. That is something that you could Google and find out. Um, anything past that, like if the if if they're in the ground longer than a certain time, they might not be able to come back. Um, but I would suspect that you probably will still see some crop up. Yeah. Yeah, it was beautiful. Uh, bush and uh, flowers are just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. There, I, I am. I thought they were called marshmallows. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> call them that now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Oh, Hold on. Hi, um, Tom. Have you read any questions yet? Okay. All right. Let me start with the first ones I have. Um, 
Do you have any suggestions, Natalie, for how to get rid of existing common periwinkle? Yeah, so you can do um, a chemical treatment. And I know that people will typically shy away from chemical treatment, um, but that is really what we recommend with our Sysma very often. Um, you can, there's a array of different chemicals that you can use um, and you'll want to really consider the habitat before you choose one. Um, for example, your distance to water will change what you use. Um, but I would just use any type of foliar spray um, with that kind of species and you'll want to do it before it goes to seed. Um, that's something that you can contact your local conservation district for. Um, if they do house or have a strike team, a lot of them will offer that service um, and they will come out and treat them for you. Um, or it is something that you can also find a lot of resources for online as well um, for foliar spraying that type of species. Okay. And then do you have any recommendations instead of periwinkle that is good in the shade? Yeah, so that wild uh, ginger is really good in the shade. It does really well under um, forested, um, open understory forests. It does really well in that kind of area. And that will create um, a mat, but it won't get out of control like your periwinkle could potentially, if that makes sense. Okay. And But if you want that purple, I would recommend the violet. The prairie violet is a good one. Prairie violet. Are there any native grasses for shade or are there any natives that repel ticks? Not that I know of for ticks specifically. Um, if you go to a native nursery, they can um, walk you through different grasses and sedges that might be good in that habitat. Um, but when it comes to things that repel ticks specifically, I, I would not um, claim that something does or does not repel ticks, unfortunately. Next is, um, is there, uh, someone's been told that there's a non-native dogwood that they shouldn't plant. Can you speak to that? I cannot, I do not know about that. Um, but it is something that I can definitely, I have the resources to look into and get back to you if you are interested. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Um, is swamp rose mallow related to Rose of Sharon? Yeah, they're, I think they're both hibiscus. That's why that one gets me so excited because I grew up with um, Rose of Sharon in my parents' garden. And then once I went into biology, I found out it was non-native and which isn't a bad thing, it's not invasive. Um, but my coworker informed me that this is, the, the mallow is like our Michigan equivalent basically of, of that, which I was really excited about. Okay. How about is common periwinkle the same as creeping myrtle? Ye yes, they are the same. They're two common names for the same thing, I believe. Okay. And then um, is English ivy invasive? Any comments on that? Yes, I almost included that one in this presentation, um, but I did not because there is some, um, there's some discussion of whether or not you can claim it is technically invasive in Michigan. I will say it has invasive tendencies. So really, um, you can tell if something is invading a space just by its sheer ability to take over. So if you have, you know, English ivy in your yard and it is moving out of the place that you put it um, on a yearly basis, and when you try to remove it, it just comes right back. I would call that an invader. It's where you don't want it and it's causing harm. Um, so on a case by case basis, um, I think it's fair to say yes, but I don't think the state of Michigan technically claims it as one, if that makes any sense. Okay, very good, thank you. That's mm -hmm. all I have in the chat. So if anyone else um, joining us on Zoom today would like to unmute themselves and ask a question, please feel free to do so now. Yeah, I have a question, um, Natalie. Can you give us some examples of species that are not native to Michigan, but are also not invasive? 
Yeah, so the Rose of Sharon is a really great example of that. Um, and so is Lilac, um, one of my other favorites that is not native. So, and, and you know, that's really an important point to drive home. Um, and why it's important to do our research on these things too, because there are non-native species that aren't, they're not bad. They're not gonna take over um, your space or get out into our forests and create an issue. Um, so things like lilac and um, um, Rose of Sharon and, hmm, those are the only two that are coming into my head at the moment, but there are a lot of them. Um, just because it's non-native doesn't mean it's invasive. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, Kim, if there are no other questions, um, it is a beautiful day, everybody. Good <laughs> Enjoy some time outside. Thank you so, so much, Natalie. That was great. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you for having me. Natalie. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Yep. Bye, Kim. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tom.